Also joining us this morning uh, and talking about Murray Wards and the incredibly low turnout, um, incredibly low turnout of Maori wards. Um, remember, councils can now, without actually mandating, be mandated by the democracy, they can also set up Maori wards in their area. And one of those um, who has been opposed to it is the Wellington mayoral candidate, Wayne Chung. And he joins us, sorry, Ray Chung, and he joins us now. He's also standing um, for the Onslow Western General Ward, although I see it's got a Maori name, Farangi. Uh, he's within Wellington City. He's got some very strong views on Maori wards. He joins us now. Ray, good morning to you. Um, are you feeling hey. a bit nervous? Um, well, I'm actually too tired to feel nervous. It's just been a hectic um, run um, in the last uh, last oh, three weeks or so. We've, I've had 23 meetings. And so they've just followed one one after another, and um, yeah, so it's, it's just been so hectic that no, I haven't had time to feel nervous yet. But I think that probably by this afternoon I'll, I'll start feeling a bit. Oh, what's going to happen tomorrow? Um, you know, how many how many people are going to go out there and vote for me, and um, where we're, where are we going to end up? And now you're um, I, I don't take this as an insult, but yep. are you sta you're standing for both the mayoralty and for uh, general ward in Wellington? Did you stand yes, for the correct, mayoralty yep. to get the publicity or the promotion to up your chances of getting onto the council in the, in the general ward? In, initially, about maybe about six months ago, um, or oh, we, well back before April, maybe um, maybe February or March, um, that was actually suggested to me that um, they looked at the the candidates who ran in the last election, um, and they ran for for mayor and for for council. And they get they get a lot more publicity because people aren't so interested in who runs for council these days. So they're more interested in who runs for mayor. And so it was suggested to me that I could actually look at that. So I, I sort of tossed it back and forth for a while and talked to a few people because um, running for mayor is, is just a lot more work than um, than running for council. And and I'm working full time, and so you know I, I didn't really have a lot of time to spare. But. Uh, the, the, the big surprise came when um, the Don Post called me and said that, hey, look, um, you know, have you uh, seen the latest poll? And I said, no, no, I haven't, haven't seen any. And said, um, you're uh, currently sitting at 13% um, and running fourth. And so uh, I thought, well, that's, that's, I, I, was, I was probably more surprised than anyone else. So, so once that happened, I thought I started taking it seriously because I thought that my message must be gelling with um, a lot of people outside my own ward. And they must be agreeing with the, the things that I'm standing for. And so I thought, well, if I'm getting widespread support, um, and certainly to get to fourth place, you know, behind the um, the, the first three who have spent a fortune on, on promoting themselves, and of course who have name recognition, um, then there must be something in that message. So um, so then I, I started um, you know, canvassing in earnest, um, you know, for the mayoralty. Um now, Ray, you also, we were talking yesterday about Chinese migrants and we're talking about culture yep. and, and things like that. I'm interested in your background. When did your, um, did, uh, are you a first generation, second generation or fifth generation Chinese? No, no, I'm, I'm third generation. My my father um, came from, from Guangzhou or Guangdong, um, from a little village up in China, and and he was chased out by the um, by the communists when oh, they yeah. came. Yeah. And so so he he came down to New Zealand. He went to Australia first, and he went to New Ze came to New Zealand. And my mother was born here in Wellington. Um, so and I'm I'm one of nine uh, no ten siblings. So um so yeah, from a big family. Right. One of the things I also talked about yesterday was um, how um, homogenous Chinese culture was in the sense that you know I know. I've got friends who are Chinese who came out, or their ancestors came out in the 1880s for the, or 1860s actually for the gold, and stayed. Yeah. Um, yet they've always married Chinese and have retained their culture and their language. This is five, six generations later. Are you in? Are you similar to that? Our family is actually um, a, a bit of each here. When I grew up, by um, it was actually interesting. When I went to to primary school, um, after finishing primary school at three o'clock, we had to go to Chinese school, oh. and, and and so we had to learn learn how to speak Cantonese, uh, learn how to speak and read and, and write Cantonese. Yeah. And so I thought 
at, at that age, you know, at five years old, I thought that was very, very unfair because um, <laughs> here we are in, in, yeah, in, in a country where everyone speaks English and all my friends sort of after school, they went off to play or they um, went off to do things, but I couldn't because I had to go to Chinese school. And so, and, and as our whole family did. And, and so I complained to my parents. I said, I don't understand why we have to do this because, um, you know, everyone speaks to us in English. And they said that, look, your, a lot of your relatives, your older relatives, your aunts and uncles, they only speak Chinese. And so if you want to communicate with them, then you're going to have to communicate with them in Chinese. But most of all, my father said to me, says, you've got to um, um, keep your language, retain your language, because if you lose your language, then you lose your culture. And if you lose your culture, you don't know where you came from. And I said, but I know where I came from. I was born here in Wellington. So, you know, I, came, I was born in Newtown. <laughs> and so... And he said, no, no, the, the whole background, you know, you've got to know where, you know, your parents came from. I've got to know where he came from, where his parents came from. Um, and so it goes back, like, um, our family, my, my mother's family goes back, her, her grandparents, they came in the 1880s. So they, they've got a, a huge heritage, but that Chinese culture, I think, was, was sort of pulled up through those years and, um, and, and just repeated. I guess the other so, thing, too, would be that... Um and you would have struck it, surely. Uh, how old are you? Yeah. Um, oh, I don't want to say things. <laughs> oh, well, are you in yeah. your mid fifties or are you in your sixties? Yep, in sixties. Okay. Yep. Well, you say the same generation as I am. You would yep. have. I mean, I was just going to say. Um, let's be honest about it. Um, we weren't quite as tolerant when you were growing up in the sixties and seventies um, at school. Yeah. So you would have got the sort of chink, sort of type um, racial abuse and stuff like that, which you would have automatically um, got. I think everybody was bullied in those days, irrespective of their ethnicity, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you would have suffered that. Um, having said that, do you notice that now at all? Is that gone from our, our society as a general rule? I notice that... I actually think it's actually gone the opposite way. I think that people are accentuating the races and accentuating where you came from and, and making um, big things out of, out of any little comment about it. Whereas it was actually interesting because when I when I was at primary school, I never encountered it at all. And I had you know we had you know lots of different races um, um, at primary school, and and then when I went to college, there it wasn't really sort of mentioned there um, much either, except for oh um, uh, you know we, we we're going to go and put you into a, um, a position in, in the rugby team, but because you're you're little and you're not as strong as these um, big island and big Maori boys, you know we won't put you in the forwards. You know we'll um, we'll put you in the in the backs um, or in wing, and um, and you just have to learn how to run like hell. So, <laughs> you know, so it was I'd more, be running from those more, big Maori boys too, actually, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was more more. Um, describing this as, as a um, as a physical size rather than you know the different yeah. races, yeah. and and I actually think that it's actually gotten much much worse now, and and the government I think is um, actually perpetuating this, um, and and not only the government but also um, local government, the city council I think is doing the same thing. So it's um, I actually feel that we're actually going backwards as far as race relations are concerned. Well, you wouldn't be wrong there. You are also uh, opposed to Maori wards. Is there a move to have Maori wards put into Wellington? I yes, they have got Maori wards in Wellington. That, that was voted on, but I I consider that was very undemocratic, and I actually went to do a submission and and opposed it. Um, you know, based on 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 facts. Now, there's a um, there's the 2001 Electoral Act. Uh, implicitly states that all wards, all ward constituencies have to be plus or minus 10% of each other. So in Wellington, the average number uh, of people in um, of constituents in each ward representative, that is for each councillor, is 14,810. And so to abide by that, um, by that 2001 Electoral Act, then the Maori ward also has to abide by that number. However, there's only 9,300 uh, people on the Maori roll which means that it's actually 35% below that number. So according to the Act, it wouldn't, it wouldn't pass the Act. So what um, Minister Mahuta did was she changed the law to exempt the, um, the Maori wards from that law. And I, I consider that to be absolutely undemocratic. It's, it's terrible. Um, people shouldn't change the law to suit any, to suit any one group. Now, it's not anti-Maori and it's not anti the Maori wards, but it's, it's that we shouldn't be changing the law to suit different people. Um, but the other thing, but, but the other thing about Maori wards, of course, was the idea that um, Maori are excluded from the local government process. So you need uh, a way of getting a Maori voice around the table. 
I'm looking now at the daily returns for your, all your different wards in Wellington. I'm sure that you're aware yep. of them as well. Um, yes, and the Maori ward trails. It's pathetic. 78% of Maori living in Wellington haven't voted despite being eligible for the Maori ward. Um, that's, that's the worst turnout of any of the six wards that you have in Wellington. Doesn't this rather yep. prove that the process isn't working at engaging Maori? No, no, I don't believe that at all. I, I think that if you, you know, running for council or running for any office is open to everyone. It doesn't matter where you're from. It That's doesn't right. matter what you're back. Yeah. Well, Paul so Eagle's a good example. He's running for mayor. Tory Fano. Yes. Both Maori yes. candidates. Yes. That's right. And and even even more important still is that um, there were already two Maoris on on the city council even before this came about. There was Tamitha Poor and Jill Day. And so when they talk about, oh, we need to have um, every representation, we need to have um, Maori wards to, to get uh, to get them at the table. But in fact, they were already at the table. In fact, if you look at the um, the percentage of Maoris, and I don't like working on percentages because we keep coming out and saying, oh, there's 15% of this race or 16% of this race, so therefore 16% or something of this company or organisation or um, or council should be made up of those numbers. Um, and and then they only they only use that when it actually suits their mantra. Like for example, we talk about diversity a lot, and we talk about oh, um, we should have diversity in, in the city council. So therefore, that means um, we should have an equal number of men and women. But you've got to get those people um, who are interested in running for council to actually put their hands up and do it. So like if you look at the Wellington City Council, we have um, 11 women and three men. So that's not equal. But no one complains about that. But mm. they'd complain if it was the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, all right. No, I, I understand that. Anyhow, I see they've also given all your wards a Maori name as well. So yours is Farangi, Onslow Westland, and it's Takapu, yep. uh, Northern General, etc. Blah blah blah. Um, okay, you're a fa Wellington is a different place. In actual fact, I it's so different to the rest of New Zealand um, that Dr. Bryce Edwards made the point that it is run by a professional managerial class basically of, of senior civil servants and media and, and, and PR lobbyists. And his argument yeah. was that um, Wellington is run by those people um, who are very well paid, generally pretty well educated and are imposing their beliefs and their policies upon the rest of us um, who don't live in Wellington irrespective. Um, do, you, do you accept some of that thesis? Yes, I do. I do. Um, we... We, we seem to have lost lost sense of um, of what democracy actually is. Like after after the city council decided to um, to um, institute Maori ward, I went in to do a submission on this, and I and I talked to them about this, and I said that look, if you want to actually retain democracy and to to make sure that everyone is treated absolutely equally, then what you should do is you'd reduce the number of um, of constituent people or constituents in each ward to the same number that's in the Maori ward. No, oh, sorry, not in the Maori ward, in oh, the yeah. on the Maori roll. Yeah. So yeah. if you reduce all the um, all the constituencies to nine thousand three hundred and ten, then that means that once again it's absolutely equal and compliance with the um, two thousand one electoral act. And but then they said, oh, but that means that we actually increase the number of councillors to about twenty two, twenty two or twenty three. And I said, yes, that's correct. And but that's not creating a precedent at all because about. 16, 18 years ago, we actually had 25 councillors in, um, in the Wellington City Council. So it's, it's, it doesn't... It I doesn't, understand, um, I understand yeah. your general yeah. point, because I'm looking here at the number of electors in the Maori ward, and it's 5,800. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet, of that 5,800, uh, just a little over 1,200 have actually voted. So, obviously, yes. mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a system they've embraced. Um, all right, now, mm. uh, let's be honest... You're probably going to get elected um, in the Onslow ward, I would suggest to you. No, you, sound, you, sound, you, you make that sound like a bad thing. No, 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 no. Well, I, yeah. I'm just about to say I don't think you're likely to get elected to the mayoralty just because um, yep. of, of the way things are. So at least you'll be around the table with, with a bit of luck, right? Um, but yes. who, if, if it's not going to be you, I think that's the easiest way to say it so you don't have to run yourself down. Yep. If it's not going to be you, who do you think under the STV system that Wellington has, is going to be elected mayor at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. There's a lot of speculation that, um, that the people who vote, who give me a number one, will.
probably give um, Andy Foster the number two. Yeah, I'm thinking. Um, but I don't. I don't actually know that because it's interesting because I've been I've been doing a lot of door knocking, a lot of talking to people over the last over the last six months, and um, and even in his own area and his own sort of stronghold, um, people have have issues about um, about Andy and said that look, we actually need to have a change. We need to have a change of direction. Um, but what is that change of direction? And I actually feel that. Um, if, if you look at my values, then I think that my values are probably closer aligned to um, to Andy than they are to Tory or to to Paul. Um, so having said that, I think that they're probably it probably is a good um, guess. Oh, I see what you mean. So if if the, if it works on, let's just say if it works on the polling system, and that, yeah. um, you're at four, then when yeah. you get knocked out, your votes go to Foster, which gives him a boost up there, which means that. It's likely then that either Tory Fano or Paul Eagle will fall out, and then it'll be a yep. straight out drag race between Andy Foster and whoever survives of those two. Is that what you're thinking? Yes, yes, absolutely correct. But I think that the STV system is actually it, it, well. Some people say it's really simple, but other people say, "Look, I can't understand it. It's, it's really complicated." But if you look at the last election where Justin Lester and um, and Andy Foster were sort of running head to head. In all of the iterations up to the final one, Justin Lester was actually ahead. So Justin Lester had more ones than um, than Andy, but Andy started picking up the uh, the votes from the people that were knocked out um, in the in the iterations, and so that way he gained more and more um, more and more sort of votes yeah. um, onto his onto his number one. So eventually he actually won by 62 votes, which is is a, it's a tiny tiny margin when you consider that is you know that's out of about 25 or 26 thousand or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this time, people were saying, "Okay, we know what happened last time," and there's, um, I think, there's nine of us running for mayor, and so, so what will happen is that the um, yeah, but there's only four the one serious the ones, aren't there? Because we've interviewed yes. some of your other candidates, and they're as crazy as we'll get out. So, um, <laughs> yeah. there, there are there are only four of you that are serious. So once those are the little, and that, so those other five won't get many votes. It, it doesn't get yep, start correct. to get interesting if the polling is right until it gets to you. Yes, that's right. So, so those once once those five um, start getting um, um, iterated out, their votes will go to their number twos. Mm. And so, if you look at those people, like let, let's take an example. Say, take Ellen for example. I mean, she's running on um, on you know livable city. I I suspect that her number two votes would probably go to Tory. Um, so, I mean, I'm I'm only guessing. Maybe, maybe Tory, maybe um, maybe to um, to poor, but. Uh, they probably won't go to um, to Andy. So therefore, when when she gets knocked out, they'll they'll get her her votes. Oh, you so, see, no, you're absolutely right. She'll, she's she's a, she's a yeah. greenie. So there are two greenies. There's yeah. Tory Farno. Just to explain, because a lot of people don't know what's going on in Wellington. So I should explain. Yeah. Tory Farno was the former. Well, she was the chief of staff for the Green Party at Parliament. So she in yes, essence correct. is the Green Party candidate. Labour have a yep. candidate, it's Paul Eagle, who is the Labour MP for Rongatai, um, so there'd be a by-election yep. where he'd have won, and then of course there's the incumbent, Andy Foster, and then there's you. Um, some of these minor candidates, for example, you're absolutely right, um, Ellen, God, whatever her name is, um, Ellen Blake, um, she's standing, yep, yep. but she's a Green, clearly a Green-aligned individual. Why would you vote for Ellen Blake and not for, for, vote for Tory Farno if you were a Green Affiliated. I, I think. I think that. Um, and again, this is this is only the feedback that I've been getting from um, people that I talk to. Is that um, a lot of people concerned that Tory doesn't have the experience. Um, she, she's been in the Green Party, but that's a, that's the only experience. And and also she's worked for a PR company. So um, and again, you know, I'm not disparaging PR companies, but um, the the feeling amongst a lot of people is that if you work for a PR company, then then you know the patter and you know the spin. So how much of that can you actually believe, and how much of that is spin? Yeah. So I think there's that that concern as well. All right. Um, well, Ray, thank you very much for joining us this morning. I wish you the best of luck tomorrow. Um, like everybody, you'll be sitting on um, a hot tin or hot, hot coals or something. Uh, I'm sure you'll be elected as a councillor and I'm sure that uh, Wellington will be the better for it. Best of luck. Okay, so that's um, Ray Chung from... Um, yes, uh, so I just wanted to talk about Maori wards and that was a classic case of Maori wards where the turnout, not only are the wards a fraction of the size of everywhere else, so they're already skewed, 
um, in terms of politics, but the turnout is crap. Uh, so if Māori don't vote in Māori wards, isn't the issue Māori? 